Anyway, good morning. This morning we're going to cover some ground in the book of Nehemiah. Um, first question, how many of you are readers? Read books. Read Kindles. Do you like biographies? Okay, have you read biography recently on Abraham Lincoln? Okay, JFK. J- oh, JFK, we have a taker. Uh, Nehemiah. Okay, good. Nehemiah is a book I careened into in my devotions, and I really love uh, biographies because you can see people's successes and their mistakes and change your life accordingly if you pay attention. I grew up in South Florida with Cubans and Jewish kids, and the Jewish kids were the smartest, most creative people. I just couldn't believe it. And most of us know that the best stand-up comedians are Jewish, you know, the best this, the best that. If you saw a list of the things that Jews have accomplished uh, since way back, it's amazing how God has touched these people. Nehemiah is no different. We're going to talk about rebuilding the walls of your life. And let me just ask you, what do you do when your world starts to crumble, when things start to fall apart? When you feel like God's not any place close to you, when you're alone and you're broken and discouraged, what about when you know that what you're suffering is from your own doing? How do you restore and rebuild things when they're that shattered? Well, Nehemiah has some answers for us. The first six chapters of Nehemiah are a really awesome example of listening to a godly calling seeing godly leadership, and seeing godly obedience, and most especially seeing God's desire to restore his people. We're going to see that Nehemiah overcame a whole bunch of deterrents that were in his way to the calling that God had for him, which was to rebuild the walls and to restore the place and the people where God once dwelt and glorified, Jerusalem. So follow me through some of these verses as we see the application that God has for us this morning. So if you'll start with me in Nehemiah chapter 1, we're going to start right at the beginning. Nehemiah 1.1, the words of Nehemiah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the citadel, which is in modern day Iran. It's about 150 miles north of the uh, Persian Gulf that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with me, or came to me with men from Judah. I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these things, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. You know, God had chosen Jerusalem to be the dwelling place for his name so he could actually physically dwell among his people according to the commandment that Moses gave to the Israelites. In Deuteronomy 12.5, it reads like this, But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses, out of all your tribes, to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. Well, during the reign of Solomon, the temple was actually built in Jerusalem, and Israel had risen to the height of all of its glory. Jerusalem's fame really caused all nations to acknowledge the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you can read about that in 1 Kings chapters 5 through 10. There's a great history lesson there about Jerusalem, about the building of the temple. Yet the unfaithfulness of God's people led to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar spent two solid years with his entire army on his siege of this city until he finally broke through its walls and destroyed it. And that story is in 2 Kings chapter 25. It remained in that same condition for almost 150 years. God's chosen city was ruined by its own sin for the whole world to see. Nehemiah's calling came in 444 B.C., and at the time he was the cupbearer of the king Artaxerxes I, and he was prompted by the report by his brother Hanani, 
who had just journeyed from Shushan to Jerusalem and back. And that journey was a thousand miles one direction. It took about four months to do. It was a pretty big deal. Nehemiah 1.3, where again, Hananiah's report, the survivors who are left from captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates are burned with fire. Well, at that time, a city had walls that were indicative of the protection from enemies if the walls were solid and built, a well-armed militia, and the strength of the God of that people. Strong walls meant everything. And Jerusalem's condition was bad beyond imagination. And look at Nehemiah's response to this report. He says in verse 4 there, So it was when I heard these words, I sat down, I wept, I mourned for many days, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So Jerusalem's condition was just a horrible reflection of the spiritual pride of God's people and the wrath that followed as God fulfilled his promise because of the disobedience of his people. His dwelling place and his people were in ruins. Well, how do we apply this? I think that believers have a particular nature about us, and it's because God surrounds us with spiritual walls when we establish a relationship with him. Psalm 139.5 says, speaking to the Lord, you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. So God has protected us and built walls around us for protection when we walk with him. Yet it's possible to tear those walls down and to tear down the work of his hand by our own sinful actions, by our thoughts, sometimes by our circumstances, and especially from our refusal to repent. My observation is that each of us can really quickly become a city without walls, broken, and vulnerable to every kind of spiritual attack. I think, too, that we have, as believers, an instinct to fall into different traps when things don't go well. The scripture says that we are sinners saved by grace through faith in Ephesians 2.8. Yet, I think sometimes we hold ourselves to a standard of behavior that we think we're falling short of achieving and it drives us to a state of self-condemnation. If you've experienced this, you know what it's like. It's devastating, and I've done it. Maybe you have. As a young believer, I remember thinking if I thought even one ill thought, my deal was done. God was through with me because I came out of a pretty religious church, and you always felt the oppressive condemnation of a God of wrath, and I didn't know the God of grace and mercy. So when I heard the words, the mass is ended, go in peace, my brothers and I would take off as fast as we could run. And so would the people I went to church with. I remember cars zipping through the parking lot, you know, near collisions, as everybody seemed to want to escape that place. So I grew up with this sense that I'm never going to get it right here. And then when I came to believe in the cross and the salvation that was offered to me and that somebody died for my sins and accepted me just how I was, it was almost too much. And yet I still created this standard of behavior for myself where I kept slipping and falling and messing it up. And after a while, you just get used to it. It can become your reality if you let it. In fact, we have a national... Here's some quotes for you. We have a national day that I call, well, I guess I really am that bad a person day, and that's New Year's Day. We come up with resolutions for ourselves and a standard of behavior, and I think the statistics are by the time you get to March, everybody has messed up every resolution. So it's about 100%. And then we reset them for the next year and do it over and over again. Believers are more prone to this, I think, than others. In Psalm 38.3, the scripture says this about our sin. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. So when we have sin in our lives and we don't reconcile it with the Lord, you're ripping the walls down of protection that God put about you. 
And the sin becomes the thing. Your lack of good behavior drives you away from the Lord. How many can say that they've never struggled with the enormity of their own sin? I mean, I hope all of us can go, man, I cannot do this. I don't have the ability to overcome this sin. Our own sinful behavior drives us sometimes, even though the scripture teaches us that God has absolute authority and grace that covers every sin that we could ever commit when we repent. It causes your relationship with the Lord to break down, and it destroys the trust that you've been called to have in him. So the first trap is we set a standard and fail. The second trap, we run into circumstances in our lives that you didn't have any part of creating sometimes, and those circumstances start to consume you, and they tear down the confidence and the sense of protection that you have in the Lord. Psalm, 43, Psalm 143, verse 3 says, The enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. <coughs> Excuse me. If you have suffered the loss of someone, if you have suffered through this financial stress that we're all going through, where life was just great. You had all your ducks in a row, and then it was stripped out of your hands. I remember in 2008, I read a story of a, a stockbroker in South Florida that was very wealthy, and there's a lot of trade and a lot of commerce in South Florida. Uh, this guy lost $300,000 in one day in his investments, and he pulled a gun out of his desk and killed himself. So <laughs> his circumstances overwhelmed him, he couldn't deal with it, and he took his own life. Sometimes it seems that way, that things are not worth living for. And you understand that sense of persecution sometimes that can occur too, if your circumstances aren't going your way. It is overwhelming. And it causes the walls in your life to crumble if you allow them. The third trap is the opposite of the first one. The third trap is to create a standard of behavior and then think that you're succeeding. And what this does is it fills you with self-righteousness and it leads to what the, the world sees as the problem in the church. Excuse me. How many times have you heard people that you've invited to church say, oh, I don't want to go to that church, it's full of hypocrites. You know, they're all self-righteous. They all think they're so cool. I hear it. I don't hear it so much about our church, but I hear that um, bouncing around. That's what the world thinks about the church. People set their standard and then think that they're, they're exceeding it, and it's a trap that God's people fell into. The most glorious, powerful city there ever was, and God took away even what they had. As it says in Matthew 25, 28, in the parable of the talents, the one guy that buried his talent member because he was afraid of his harsh taskmaster. The guy said, take that talent from him and give to him who has ten. And that's what happened to Jerusalem. We are called to be a temple of God that he promises to dwell in so that the attention of the world is drawn to him. Now, how often do you think about that? That God actually made me something for the world to see as glorifying the God that I represent, that's a heavy load, but God does it every day. But because of self-inflicted condemnation or circumstances in our lives or proclaimed righteousness, the walls crumble and the presence and the power of God are gone. So how do you rebuild when your world starts to crumble? What do you do when your life is rubble on the ground? Is there more to it than just pretending that everything's okay and you're living in a broken wasteland of a life? Let's look at how Nehemiah dealt with this. If, go back to chapter 1 with me and look at verse 4. The things that Nehemiah did when he got the news of uh, the condition of Jerusalem was a great starting point. He says there, So it was when I heard these words that I sat down, I wept, I mourned for many days. 
I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So really the first step in rebuilding, you confront the problem immediately. It doesn't say there's a delay, that he thought about it. He just went right after it. He stopped what he was doing. He just sat where he was and let it sink in. Next, he took time to weep over what he had heard. Nehemiah really felt the sadness of God's chosen people and his chosen place. It took him many days to mourn over what had occurred. Remember, this is a guy that is serving the king. His job was the cupbearer. So he was supposed to drink the king's drink ahead of time to see if it was poisoned or not. So he had a you know, pretty good shot that he wasn't going to make it very far. But that was his job. And he served the Lord as a servant of the living God under a unbelieving king. And his heart was in Jerusalem all this time. So this report stopped him dead in his tracks. And it took him a long time to get over this. It says that he fasted in that verse. So he cleared even his need for food so he could focus on what was happening. Uh, I don't know how many of you fast. On Wednesdays once a month when we have our praise and worship night, uh, we fast. And I have to tell you, I was supposed to do a blood test this week, and all I had to do was fast from 8 p.m. till 8 in the morning, and I could not get myself to not have cookies and milk before I went to bed. So I blew my my little window there. It's not an easy thing. And I think in the world that we live in, fasting seems crazy. But what it does is it focuses your attention like a laser beam on what the Lord has put in front of you. Nehemiah fasted. And then the scripture says there that he prayed. And he didn't just pray, you know, like we would pray before a meal. He prayed. Look at verses 5 through 11. Nehemiah says, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you've commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to a place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Verse 10, now these are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, Artaxerxes, his boss. I like this last verse a lot, verse 11. Because God reduces the requirement to hear us to the lowest common denominator. Nehemiah doesn't say there, um, be attentive to the prayer of your servant, Nehemiah, who's done some really cool stuff and I'm really on my game. And he doesn't say, you know, your servants who are really diligently serving you, you know, listen to us because we got our act together. Look what he says. Listen to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. There are no qualifications here except just desire. All God wants from us is a desire to desire him, and he's willing to be attentive and to hear us. It means that all of us are in. Nobody's out. So Nehemiah got directly to the point. He wanted God to restore his people and restore his dwelling place in Jerusalem. Nehemiah knew God's promises and used them to open the pathway for God's response. Now, I don't know how many of you are confident enough to pray God's promises right to his face and say, hey, Lord, you promised this, this, and this. Let's see it happen. That's a scary thing. Nehemiah did it without blinking. He said, these are your promises. This is what you said would happen. It did. Now, this is your promise. Make it happen. 
He knew and confessed the sins of the children of Israel and of his own sins. And then he asked for God to make a way for him with the king so that he could respond as God answered. So the application for us is, this is how you start. When your world is crumbling, when the walls are breaking down, you stop what you're doing, you seek the Lord, you fast, you pray to him. Nothing starts without that. The second thing that happens here that's really obvious is that Nehemiah takes practical action. So he approaches the king in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. I'm not going to read this passage, but let me give you a, a little brief story here. Nehemiah knew that he could be summarily executed for approaching the king, even though he was the cupbearer. If he approached the king in a, in a manner that didn't meet the protocol, he could just be done. But it was worth the risk for him. He confronted the king. He asked him for a leave of absence that would remove him literally from Artaxerxes' service for 12 years. So if you have a trusted employee and you're a business owner and your employee says, hey, can I take off for 12 years? Uh, no, you can't. I'll find somebody else. But Artaxerxes not only didn't kill him, obviously, because we wouldn't have a story, he honored the request and asked him a couple of times, how long do you think you'll be gone? In other words, okay, um, what do you think when you're coming back? Here's what Artaxerxes did for him, too. He provided passports for Nehemiah's entourage to safely travel through those thousand miles of territory owned by who knows what kings. He also provided the best of timber from the king's forest for the rebuilding project that Nehemiah wanted to do. He sent his own captains of his army for traveling protection, and he sent a slew of horsemen with this group so that they were a force moving through that area that people wouldn't want to mess with, especially with Artaxerxes' control. So everything happened quick. He prayed, the Lord responded, he'd stepped into action, done. He's on his way. So the application for us here is, when God puts something in front of you to do, don't fear it, just do it. Now, I remember being in 10th grade and looking at the telephone with the nine or the 10 little holes in it, a little rotary dial, and I was thinking, how can I get the courage up to dial these seven numbers to call that girl I want to ask out? And it wasn't, I mean, I love to talk. It wasn't that. I was afraid of what the reaction was going to be. I had fear that paralyzed me, and I remember suffering that same sense having to call a client about something bad, sometimes having to call my wife and tell her what I just bought. But there's fear that kind of overtakes us sometimes because we don't know what's going to happen. And the fear of the unknown is the biggest fear of all. He didn't even hesitate. He just did it. And if you've ever experienced that, you know what it's like when you just go, ah, you know what, I'm sick of worrying about it. I'm just doing this. And then you do the thing, and then maybe it turns out bad, Maybe it turns out really good, but you did it, and it's over with. Um, I think as a contractor, I'm a painting contractor, if you guys don't know. Um, I'm a pleaser. I like to do good work. I like people to be happy. You know, getting a check to me is almost peripheral. I, I want people to say, wow, great job. Your employees are awesome. I mean, everything is sharp and clean. I live for that, and I think it's because my dad was kind of, tough and it was really tough to please him so my goal is always to do more than what's expected and I had a client a contractor that I had to tell I couldn't do a job for that I had committed to months earlier but I had a conflict in my schedule and he's a talker like I am and kind of rolled me right into the sequence of how the scheduling of this house was going to go and I really needed to do the job but I, I just I couldn't pull it off and I had to stop him and tell him I can't do the job. And it didn't go well. But I just remember thinking, God, I gotta tell him. And it took me a couple days to get the nerve up to finally do it. And I finally made the phone call and it was awful. I got humiliated, made fun of. Um, everything he could do to make me feel low life. And I did. And I hung up the phone, but something inside me just went, it's done. You did it. And it wasn't that bad. 
So the thing that I feared the most in my entire career just happened. I, I managed to avoid that situation for 30 years. And then when it finally happened and it was over, I just went, gosh, that's pretty cool. I want to do that again. Not that that's a good thing to do, but you understand the fear paralyzes us sometimes doing godly things, things that we know that we should do. So once God begins to move, go for it. Just step into it. Does he have something specific he's telling you? Then do it. So Nehemiah hits the problem when he gets to Jerusalem head on. More action. He gets there. He sees that Jerusalem is broken. It's tattered, left for dead. Yet, look at what he does. The very first thing, if you look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11, Nehemiah arrives and he assesses the situation. He tours the walls when he arrives, and it reads like this. So I came to Jerusalem, and I was there for three days. Then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put on my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. Verse 13, he went out by night to the valley gate, to the serpent wall, to the refuse gate, and he viewed all these walls of Jerusalem that were broken down, went to the fountain gate, the king's pool, and at night he couldn't get under uh, this area with his animals, so he went by night by the valley, he looked at the wall, and then turned back and came through the valley gate. So he went and surveyed all of the problem areas and remember, this guy fasted and mourned for days over what he was going to see. He's there now. You don't see, I was grieved even more, and it was really messing me up, and I was going to go home. You don't see any of that. He just went and surveyed it all and said, okay, this, this, and this, and this. This is what needs to be dealt with. And how many times do we skip that step? You know, you may want to get things right with the Lord. You may pray and do the things to set the foundation for him to respond, and then not want to look at it after that. Gosh, I, I really, gosh, I don't want to look at my books right now. I'm not doing good. Ah, forget it. I'll just walk away. Well, Nehemiah looked at it head on, assessed it, and he could make a plan after that. He didn't try to sugarcoat any part of this shame that he saw, the disaster, which was the result of the sin of God's people. He just pragmatically assess the damage and what would be required to rebuild it. So by going directly at the problem, he went from mourning and weeping to action. So the application here, we just have to take a good look at the issues that are creating the distress that you may be under. That's when God can step in and set you to work to rebuild the things that are torn down. The next thing Nehemiah does after this assessment, he encourages he gathered all the Israelites together, he explained the damage, and then he used his personal testimony of God's hand moving him to the task. Look at Nehemiah 2.17 with me. Then I said to them, you see the distress we're in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So you see, he's telling them everything they need to hear. He knows what to say to them. 2.18, so he said, so they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. Okay, now remember, this is 150 years of this city sitting like this with nobody doing anything. It was a mess. If you've seen pictures of a um, Midwestern town where we used to build a lot of cars recently, it is devastated. There are houses that are broken, looted, destroyed. People have abandoned Detroit, Michigan. And that's what I think Jerusalem looked like. It was ransacked because marauding bands could go through there and steal anything they wanted. The book before Nehemiah, the book of Ezra, Ezra had been commissioned to go back in and rebuild the temple. That was happening, but the city was still a, just a destroyed mess. So these people to say, let us rise up and build, I mean, it's almost like Star Wars. These are not the droids you're looking for. Like there's some kind of mind game going on. But he had encouraged them in a way that they responded to it immediately. So the application for us in this regard, we need to find encouragement and hope in God's word 
from our own personal testimony, from those around us, to rise up and get going with practical action. Psalm 31, 24 says, Be of good courage, for he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. That's the perspective God wants us to have. Next, Nehemiah handles adversity. You know, I started this study uh, probably two months ago, just thinking about it, how I wanted to present it. And I told you I grew up with Jewish kids. And I was always amazed that I couldn't think half as fast as them. I couldn't come up with funny stuff. I couldn't build stuff like they were doing. Um, Nehemiah was so good at dealing with adversity. When I read the passage that I'm actually going to skip in this study, I was amazed. I really wanted to show you the distress that came upon him, the adversity that came, and how he handled each situation. Because he was creative, he was crafty, he was smart. Well, it turns out, as I built the study, I couldn't even get to that part. There's so much here. So I'm actually going to do a follow-up study in, in October, if you can wait that long, and I'm going to cover that. But this is the foundation for that. And now I realize how the Lord's hand moved to kind of put the brakes on me here. Nehemiah handled massive adversity. And, you know, it's funny. When you do nothing, the enemy can just leave you alone. You ever notice that when things really are blasé and you're flatlining as a believer? You're not really under attack and things are sort of okay. I mean, you're not alive spiritually. You're a million miles from the Lord. But the enemy just goes and finds somebody else more important to play with and mess up. But 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So adversity pops up when you strike forward with action to do something God's called you to do. As soon as you begin to obey the Lord, adversity will conveniently pop up from every direction to knock you off your plan. Nehemiah set forth with this plan that was whispered to him by God. He motivated all these people to work, and then Satan set his minions in motion to defeat it. Here's an interesting thing. I was in Word typing this stuff up, and I typed out Satan, and it had the little squiggly line underneath it. I went, man, how, I didn't misspell that. So I right-clicked it. It wanted me to capitalize Satan. And I just said, not going to happen. <laughs> Very interesting. So for the sake of time, I'm going to go through the things that Nehemiah had to deal with, and I would encourage you uh, the way that some of my college professors encouraged me at Cal Poly. I would, I would pre-read and be ready for a class, like once in a blue moon. Inevitably, I would be sitting in class waiting to expound this great information I had and contribute finally, and he wouldn't touch any of the stuff that I read, and then said, hey, you guys got to read these next four chapters to be ready for what I want to talk about. Well, I'm going to encourage you to read these passages in, in uh, Nehemiah 2 through 6, because they're awesome. We're going to really quickly cover them, though. Look at Nehemiah 2.19, if you have a sec. When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, the building of these walls, they laughed at us and despised us and said, Who, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So they got humiliated. Next up, he had to deal with mocking in Nehemiah 4, 1 through 3. But it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Well, that's interesting, too. They used limestone in the building of buildings back then. And when Nebuchadnezzar trashed Jerusalem, the limestone went up in flames, and it chemically decomposes and turns into useless garbage. That's what that means. These stones that are burned, well, they're going to pick up the garbage and build walls with it. Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes up onto it, he'll break the stone wall. So they have to deal with that. Remember, these Israelites hadn't done squat for some time. 
and they're motivated, they're finally ready to go, and now they're just getting hammered by all this stuff out there. He was threatened by his enemies in Nehemiah 4.8. The surrounding enemies of Israel conspired against Nehemiah. What a surprise. Is that happening now to Israel? All the enemies around that little country are just conspiring against him. This will never change until the Lord comes back. <clears throat> says in Nehemiah 4.8, all of, them consp all of them conspired to come and attack Jerusalem and to create confusion. Nehemiah had to deal with the Israelites being physically exhausted, and he had to deal with trash in Nehemiah 4.10. You ever watch hoarders on television when people accumulate stuff and it ruins their lives? Can you, have you ever been to a construction site or driven by one where there's boxes and garbage and piles of stuff? Normally that house isn't going to turn out real good if you've got sloppy trades. These people are trying to work and they're hungry and tired. And the scripture says that Judah told Nehemiah, the strength of the laborers is falling and there is so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. So he has to deal with that. He had to deal with internal strife in Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1. The Jewish business leaders were ripping off the people with crazy interest rates. They were seizing their land. They were forcing families into slavery. Read a little passage here in uh, Nehemiah chapter 5. There was a great outcry of the people and their wives against the Jewish brethren. So we're talking family and family, Jewish believers. For there were those who said, we, our sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us go get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, we've mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, we've borrowed money for the king's taxes on our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been bought or brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them. For other men have our lands and vineyards. And when I do the second part of the study, you'll see Nehemiah's reaction. He was angry. He was very angry. But they were getting torn up from within. You ever experienced that in your family? You're trying to accomplish something and there's so much infighting. How about someone dies and there's money that needs to be divvied out? You ever deal with that one? It's awful what money can do to people in their own family. These people are just trying to eat and the Jewish leaders are taking their money. They're making them take out mortgages just to pay the tax. Nehemiah was distracted in Nehemiah chapter 6. Five times, Sanballat tried to get Nehemiah distracted and away from his work. In Nehemiah 6 verse 2, it says, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm, because she was really a bad singer anyway. Um, no, uh, they were trying to get him off the track and just get him confused. Nehemiah was slandered in chapter 6, verse 6. It's reported among the nations, and Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you're rebuilding the wall that you can be their king. And you've also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, ah, there's a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, let us consult together. Well, that's like someone saying, hey, the IRS is going to audit you when I call them about what I saw you do with your finances. Oh, no, please don't do that. You ever get the envelope that says IRS on it, and it's at a time when you're not thinking there should be forms coming to you? I always go, oh, man, I'm getting audited. This is not going to be good. That's what they were trying to do to Nehemiah. Oh, the king's going to hear about this, and you're in big trouble, buddy. He was distracted to, he, out of fear to go hide in the temple. In verse 10 of chapter 6, it says, Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of another guy, who was a secret informer, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they're coming to kill you. Indeed, at night, they're going to come and kill you. So he's got all of these things that are coming against him, and he, he deals with them. And what I want to do is let you know that we have tools here. We have ways of handling adversity 
as we try to rebuild the walls of our lives. And these are going to be really simple. You know, I, I really like to leave people with something to take with them that they can work with. Uh, there's nothing worse than seeing somebody, especially having this ministry, being able to, to talk and have someone say, wow, that's a great study you did. And then you go, oh, really? What part spoke to you? I don't know. Well, let's leave some tools with you. When you have things that go wrong in your life, whether you created them, whether it's circumstances, or whether you realize that you have overcompensated for your puny behavior standard, the first thing you need to do is stop what you're doing and seek the Lord. Remember what Nehemiah did. He stopped, he wept, he fasted, and then he prayed. The second thing he did, he acted without delay. He just got on it. When you pray, believing that God's going to answer you, you know, we sang a song this morning about he can move the mountains. I remember when I was an unbeliever, I read a, a book about how to get your personality all together and you could be a cool guy and people like you. Uh, there was a passage out of Mark where it said, Jesus is saying, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and don't entertain any doubt, it'll happen. And I was like, man, I can do anything. I'm going to get a car. You know, I took it out of context. If we enter into a conversation with the Lord, though, in confidence, expect that he's going to respond. And then the next thing to do is act when he speaks to you. If you don't, if you sit, the enemy will find another thing to mess you up with and nothing will get done. Next, expect adversity and then deal with it. Are you getting humiliated or mocked? Are you being threatened? Whether it's someone that you know or if it's the enemy, stay in the word and stand on the word. That's how we deal with that. Are you exhausted? Maybe you're dealing with something that's just tearing you down, whether it's a job or a loss or whatever. What you do is you stop and eat. You rest. You take care of your physical stuff so that you can deal with the rest. And if you're exhausted, you know, the scripture says that we're going to run and not be weary. We're going to mount up with wings as eagles. The promises of scripture, to me, supersede our physical being. I mean, God can do so much more than we think we're capable of. But you take care of the physical, and then you be filled with the spirit. Do you have internal strife going on? Well, pray for God's wisdom. Nehemiah prayed. He listened to godly counsel, and then he acted. And that's what the Lord would have us to do. Are there distractions in your life? It's hard for me to even come to church without my iPhone. And I don't know how you guys are. Um, I use it as a cover. Like, maybe I'll get some important text or phone call. Uh, my, my brother has an iPad that he takes to church. And I was like, come on, dude, that's worse than what I do. Well, it turns out he does have a Bible in there, and he can get verses highlighted and all these cool things. We are so distracted, we don't have a clue sometimes what the Lord's even speaking to us. And I think this is the toughest generation for believers to live in because there, there are so many things to pull your attention away. And I'm, I just read this morning that there's a company making an iPhone cover that has a 650-watt stun gun. So if you're not distracted enough, now you can have a stun gun on your iPhone. If you're distracted, focus on spending time in the Word, spending time in fellowship with believers. And, you know, I realize, too, that the most protected that I usually feel spiritually is when I'm here. You know, and we all know how hard it is to get here on a Wednesday, to get here on a Sunday morning when you have stuff going on. But when you're here, aren't you glad you're here? And you're getting fed, and you fellowship with people, and you talk to somebody that has the same issues you do. Or maybe you talk to somebody that needs your encouragement, and you have a word for them. What a cool thing. Not forsaking the fellowshipping together one with another is so important because it focuses your attention and gets the distraction pushed out to the side. And I think the most important thing is practice. Daily obedience to what God's called you to do. I don't know how many times Pastor Steve has told us about doing his devotions first thing in the morning. You know, and I'm kind of like, hey, me too, sometimes. You know, and I find other times to do devotions, but it's important that we start the day out correctly, asking to be filled with the Spirit, 
doing, having that time set aside just for him because you don't know what's coming. And if you're already struggling with something and you're trying to get your walls rebuilt and get your life together, there's more up ahead. And to start your day fortified and daily practice it, things change quickly and God moves in those situations. So in closing, I want to remind you again of a passage we covered right at the beginning. Who is it that God is looking to restore? Is he looking to restore somebody that kind of strolls in here and has all the right words and has their act together and doesn't do anything wrong? No. Nehemiah 1.11, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. Remember, God wants everyone to come to him. So the lowest common denominator, if you even desire to fear his name, you're in. You're in the game. And then finally, in 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul tells Timothy there, For I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Are you rebuilding? Do you have circumstances in your life that aren't your creation, or maybe that are? God wants to have that commitment to be there with you to rebuild those walls. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you this morning as, as Jerusalem was then. Lord, we don't have it together. Lord, we have broken gates. Lord, the strength of our cities, what people see is really broken down. And Lord, we desire, God, that we are fortified and strong. Lord, that you hedge us from behind and in front and that we walk in the protection that you provide for us. Lord, that we could be an anointed light Lord, in a dark world, in the places that we work and the people that we see. So, Father, I pray first for those that are struggling, Lord, that need to have walls rebuilt, that you would step in and speak to them as they seek you and pray to you today. And, Lord, that you would give them a specific thing to do. And, Lord, that you would give them the confidence to step out and put the fear aside. We pray you would fill them with your spirit. And then if anyone is here this morning that needs that rebuilding from the ground floor. You don't have that relationship with God where you feel comfortable even approaching him. And you need to have that protection put in front and behind. And you want to know him. I would ask that you just bow your head and pray this prayer with me this morning. Lord, I understand that I'm broken, that I've sinned against you and I've disobeyed things that you've told me to do. And I didn't know how to get to you. But I understand that you sent your son to die on a cross to pay for my sins so that I could enter into a relationship with you. Lord, I want to give you control of my life and let you have it. Lord, save me from my sins, and I pray that you would make a place for me in heaven with my name on it in your book of life. Amen. If any of you prayed with with me this morning, just raise your hand. Let's pray for you. Amen. Anyone else? Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you're gracious. Lord, that your hand is always reaching out to us. Lord, you never stop waiting on us. You just want us to wait on you. Father, we desire to fear you. And I pray today, Lord, that you would keep us close to you. I pray you'd fill each one of us with your spirit today. Lord, whether we encounter good circumstances or bad, Lord, that we would keep our attention focused on you. Lord, and we thank you that you're in the business of restoring your people and restoring us. In Jesus' name.